celiac disease or non-tropical sprue or it is also called as gluten sensitive enteropathy so why this is this is this disease is very very important nowadays because few decades back there was not so many cases of celiac disease but recently it has been seen that it has there is increased number of cases in celiac disease so first of all i would like to tell you that you have to differentiate that this is non tropical sprue and the tropical sprue is a different entity it is totally different okay so let's go for the first thing that what is the difference between non tropical and why that is called tropical okay so what is non tropical sprue and what is tropical sprue now is as the name suggests the tropical sprue it basically it occurs in tropical countries like india indonesia brazil all this kind of countries caribbean islands so the tropical climates so those people in tropical uh, countries they are having diarrhea they are having malabsorption though diarrhea is not the number one cause but they are having malabsorption and they are seen that there are some intestinal small intestinal intestinal villi changes where the non tropical sprue it is not related to any tropical countries okay and there is intestinal villi changes like this intestinal villi changes which we will discuss later on intestinal villi changes but the most important thing about non tropical sprue or celiac disease that it is an immune disorder it is an immune disorder immune disorder whereas the tropical sprue is totally caused by bacterial infections it is caused by bacterial infections not only bacterial there can be viral parasitic infections so basically in tropical sprue the treatment is totally antibiotics whereas in non tropical sprue this treatment is steroids okay so around 4 to 6 weeks of corticosteroids can heal a patient of celiac disease one more thing the tropical sprue this it don't really matters who are the native or who are expatriates it has been seen that people who stay in tropical countries they occasionally have some intestinal villi changes and they undergo malabsorption and diarrhea and all those abdominal symptoms like uh, pain abdomen sometimes bloating indigestion all those things it has been seen even because it has also seen even in expatriates who are not the native people of that and it has been observed that when they migrate from that country and goes to other country they are usually it usually heals up and it usually goes off in next 4 to 6 months so that's why it's, it is called tropical sprue because it's not related to people living there it's related to the environment living there environment there and it is because of bacterial viral and parasitic infections very commonly it is seen by gardeiasis clostridia difficile e coli those organisms have been found so treatment is mostly antibiotic and it is also seen that in tropical sprue this is this is because this question is most often asked that along with antibiotics is well noted that folic acid treatment is very important in tropical sprue because we know that in a small intestine there is vigorous absorption of folic acid in duodenum and jejunum also ileum not sorry duodenum jejunum and ileum okay and it has been seen that in tropical sprue patient there has there is been decrease of folic acid okay which leads to lots of this folic acid deficiency signs and symptoms so when there is antibiotic is combined with folic acid it is going to be give a very good result in the outcome of that patient so that is about tropical sprue so there is some intestinal villi changes like non tropical which we will discuss in detail but we call this this tropical because this is found in tropical countries this is not related to celiac disease is not related to non tropical countries it is immunological okay. let's go to the celiac disease now why we need to understand celiac disease 
why it is so important because if we see the celiac disease it is caused by the gluten which is present in cereals okay so when the people consume some people are very sensitive to this gluten like we say brow barley rye oats wheat so it has been observed that when some people consume barley rye oats or wheat they occasionally have malabsorptions they have intestinal diarrhea they sometimes they complain of pain abdomen which are the classic signs of celiac disease but it has been seen that celiac disease nowadays the recent trend is that it is not showing these classical symptoms of malabsorption it is not showing any classical symptoms malabsorption like malabsorption failure to thrive failure to thrive weight loss diarrhea pain abdomen it has recently been seen that there are only less amount less um, population that we are showing this classical signs 50% of population of celiac disease they show some atypical signs and symptoms okay so you know that these atypical symptoms are very unique okay like what are these atypical symptoms now atypical symptoms basically uh, they it has been seen the celiac disease patient they also comes with osteopenia that is decrease in density of bones so you should know what is the difference between osteopenia and osteoporosis so osteopenia is mild decrease in density and it when it goes to a larger amount means more and more loss of density then we call it osteoporosis so you can say osteopenia is a condition before osteoporosis and very surprisingly it has been shown it is related to infertility so that's why this disease celiac disease is a lot in discussion these days because it is people are presenting with osteopenia people are presenting with infertility they are also presented with cancer of a small intestine and also with lymphoma and when later on when the investigation in the, is done and there is intestinal biopsy is done then this there are some intestinal changes are seen so what are the basic intestinal changes are seen which by which we can say that this person is having celiac disease the three things to be noted here in celiac disease this number one the patient will have villus atrophy villus atrophy number two is that there is increased amount of lymphocytes increased amount of lymphocytes in the lamina propria layer of the epithelial cell in the gi cells increased lymphocytes in the lamina propria and third thing there is cryptic hyperplasia cryptic hyperplasia these are the three things that are seen when there is intestinal biopsy is done sometimes patient only present with osteopenia and infertility and then when endoscopy is done and biopsy is done intestinal biopsy you see that there is villus atrophy now what is the villus atrophy that we know in the small intestine in the duodenum jejunum and ileum it is full with villi okay we know there is villi so there is villi which so these villi are important because they increase the surface area for absorption so that's why these villi are important so in celiac disease it has been seen that these villi are atrophied now imagine these villi are needed for absorption of our nutrition so what will happen if these villi are damaged and instead of this they looks like the height has been reduced so height has been reduced because of some part of it become damaged or atrophied so if the villi have become so we know that in the villi there is microvilli also and this is called brush borders Okay, and there is a lots of brush border enzymes 
So imagine this villa has become now flat. A villa has become flat. So when the villa has become flat, or because of atrophy, because the villa substantial amount of lots of amount of villa has been lost. This amount of villa has been lost. This has been lost. So what will happen if villa is lost? Some amount of villa has been lost. So there will it will lead to malabsorption. Malabsorption of nutrients, malabsorption of iron, malabsorption of folic acid, malabsorption of fat, which will lead to a lot of signs and symptoms of celiac disease. And it has been seen that there is increased number of lymphocytes, increased number of lymphocytes in the lamina propria layer. And there is cryptic hyperplasia, cryptic hyperplasia in the crypts. There is hyperplasia. So these three things are seen in the intestinal biopsy. And then only it is diagnosed that it is celiac disease, though it is not the, it is hallmark, but it cannot say 100% diagnostic feature of celiac disease. Because ultimately we have to do serological studies where we get antibody to endomycium and antibody to transglutaminase, which we'll discuss in investigation. So ultimately serological st studies will give 100% or 95 to 100% you can say this result and diagnosing of celiac disease. So to understand this, why there is villous atrophy, why there is increased lymphocytes, let's go and uh, understand the pathophysiology. What is the pathophysiology here? So we know that the cereals they contains when wheat they I mean the wheat barley or what they can they contain gluten. So what happens when somebody with celiac disease they consume gluten, gluten containing food, a food containing gluten. So so let's say there is here in the duodenum. Okay, we have. So this is a brush board villi, all right. So the person has taken gluten in his diet, which can be presented in barley, rye, oats or wheat, okay. So gluten is, so what will happen here, okay, when gluten comes, right. So let's zoom this part, let's zoom this part. So this is one villi. Okay, and we know there is the this is the area of lamina propria. Alright, this is submucosal there, so this is the epi enterocytes, epithelial cells. So usually this gluten is broken down and they are absorbed or they are digested, whatever it happens. But in celiac disease, there is this is the thing that is not so known properly, but it, the thing is that this gluten or the component of gluten, which is which is basically absorbed, is gliadin. So this gliadin portion present in the gluten, <coughs> it is seen that from the lumen, this gliadin is absorbed from the lumen. This gliadin, okay. So I write G L. So because of gliadin, so this gliadin will be absorbed to the lamina propria layer. To the submucosal layer, lamina propria layer. This gliadin is absorbed. That is the thing that now is still in research that why a big molecule, a macro molecule like gliadin, can be absorbed. Why there is increased permeability to this gliadin molecule to the submucosal layer, to the subepithelial layer. Now, what happens when gliadin is brought below the epithelium? So, we are saying that gliadin is brought here. So gliadin is, it migrates, gliadin, it migrates to the below the enterocytes. So here, when the gliadin is rich, it starts both adaptive immunity and innate immunity. And once the gliadin is there, then what happens, this enzyme called transglutaminase, transglutaminase, which we write tissue trans glutaminase, tissue transglutaminase or TTG. So this glutamine, 
this glide in component is broken down or not say broken down it is deaminated it is deaminated by this transglutaminous enzyme by this ttg tissue transglutaminase so it will deaminate there will be deamination reaction and there will be this gliding component will be then re so reformed into a new epitopes okay so it will be deaminated so these are deaminated gliding components okay so we can say these are deaminated deaminated gliding now what happens to this deaminated gliding this deaminated gliding starts both the adaptive immunity and innate immunity okay so let's bring this whole thing here let's see what this d so here is the deaminated gliadin which is formed from gliadin by tissue trans tissue transglutaminous enzyme so it broke it not broke it uh, just uh, reformed the gliadin is reformed into what we call new epitopes so now this will be this epitopes or this new product of gliadin or we can say modified gliadin it is then taken it is then uh, it is then identified by dendritic cells it is identified by dendritic cells which you call a classic dendritic cells this classic dendritic cells will one thing you will do it will stimulate the it will recruitment of neutrophils there will be a lot of neutrophil recruitment which is a now part of our innate immunity lot of neutrophils will be recruitment will be recruited by interleukin 8 this classic dendritic cells what else they can do they take this gliadin epitopes this gliadin epitopes this modified gliadins they take this mo modified gliadins and put it towards t helper cells t helper cells or antigen presenting cells which is again a part of our innate immunity to the antigen presenting cells now what this antigen presenting cells do they take this epitopes and present it to b cells they take this epitopes and present it to b cells then when this b cells will interact with this epitopes or this modified gliadin they will then, then you know what happens in immunity now this is a adaptive immunity okay this part is adaptive immunity so what happens this b cells when they interact with this modified gliadin then you know what happens in adaptive immunity now this b cells will be modified and they will become plasma cells so these b cells will be then modified to plasma cells now these plasma cells will make antibodies they make antibodies antibodies now these antibodies are directed so what antibodies they make they make antibodies against this trans glutaminous enzyme this tissue trans glutaminous enzyme which we call as anti tissue trans glutaminous they not only make antibodies against this trans glutaminous they also make antibodies against endomycin okay so they make antibody endomycin also they make another third group of antibodies they also make another group of antibodies that is antibody against this gliadin so anti gliadin so we can see as a result of this modified gliadin there are three antibodies that are formed there are three antibodies that are formed there are three antibodies that are formed one is 
antibody to antibody to tissue transglutaminase number 2 antibody to endomycin number 3 antibody to gliadin antibody to gliadin so these three antibodies are formed so in this whole scenario this transglutaminase this tissue transglutaminase they behave as auto antigen so this antigen antibodies they target this tissue transglutaminase so tissue transglutaminase without any reason they become a victim we can say they become the antigen here so that's the concept of auto antigen okay so they become auto antigen so these antibodies they are mainly directed against the tissue transglutaminase so if you remember from your physiology or anatomy that endomyosin is a component of muscles so what is endomyosin this endomyosin is a component of smooth muscles so not sorry smooth muscle it's a muscle is a component of muscle so when you see the muscle fiber so if you take it this is a skeletal muscle okay and you see there is muscle fibers in the muscle so all these muscle fibers are coated with a sheet it coated with a it is coated it's coated with a covering this covering is called endomycin inside this endomycin there are enzymes there are enzymes which are these enzymes are tissue transglutaminase enzyme so what is what is the role of tissue transglutaminase enzyme they basically help in cross linking of proteins like so this tissue transglutaminase what they do they basically help in the cross linking I mean lysine and glutamine in the protein they are connected so this enzyme they connect the lysine this is a amino group of lysine amino group of, of lysine and a amide group of glutamine they cross link it so when they cross link these two amino acids lysine and glutamine cross link then this protein resists denaturation so protein is okay, you can say the destruction of protein is not so easy so it resists the protein denaturation okay that's why this it gives strength to the muscle you can say so this transglutaminase enzyme it basically explains the cross link of proteins cross link making the muscle more stronger now what happens in celiac disease there is antibodies against this enzyme there is antibodies against this endomyosin there is antibodies against the gliadin so these all antibodies which are produced by the b cells they are directed against it and results in the rest of the uh, pathology of the celiac disease now coming back here so once there is a neutrophils is in the scenario we know that there is inflammation will be start so inflammation has started so you know this part is this part up to the recruitment of neutrophils t helper cell this is the innate immunity which is present from birth so innate immunity is the immunity which is the oldest immunity and it's present from the birth like complement system like the skin like neutrophils antigen presenting cells these are part of our innate immunity so when this modified gliadin is recognized by the classic dendritic cells it starts the inflammatory process by recruiting neutrophils with the help of interleukin 8 so these neutrophils when they are recruited they start doing the inflammation process so the basic the foundation is already laid now inflammation process has started in the intestinal villi so now that because of the neutrophil recruitment this intestinal villi there is inflammation process there is inflammation process inflammation has started lot of neutrophil recruitment and then there is antibodies this antibody is directed against this transglutaminase resulting in weakness and resulting in damage of the villi so ultimately because of the now antibodies are also here this antibodies so 
So these antibodies are not only against gliadin, they are also against endomycin, they are also against transglutaminase, plus there is lots of inflammation is there. So as a result, the whole villi will now be flattened. Okay, so this happens in celiac disease. Okay, so let's recap. So what happens in celiac disease? The transglutaminase enzyme, that is tissue transglutaminase enzyme, tissue transglutaminase, tissue transglutaminase enzyme, it behaves as an autoantigen. It is the target against which these three antibodies are formed. So there is absorption first. So this is the intestinal villi and gliadin component of the gluten is absorbed. So as a result, there is lots of inflammation, lots of lymphocytes will be there. So when gliadin is absorbed, this gliadin then modified into epitopes. So modified gliadin, you can say, modified gliadin will be formed, small, small, modified gliadin by the transglutaminase enzyme, tissue transglutaminase, because this is a deamination reaction. Then this is recognized by the classic dendritic cells and starts the process of innate immunity by recruiting neutrophils and adaptive immunity by stimulating the B cells by put so these cells, so, sorry, these epitopes or this modified gliadin are presented by the antigen presenting cells and they present it to the B cells. Say this is the antigen, make a antibody. So they start producing antibodies. So these antibodies are directed against endomycin, gliadin and TTG. Why this is important? Because this is the basic marker for, or we can say basic diagnostic marker in serology test to diagnose someone with a celiac disease. So when you have to diagnose celiac disease, not only you will see there is villus, there will be a flattening of villi or villus atrophy, then cryptic hypertrophy or hyperplasia, and lots of lymphocytes, yeah, lots of lymphocytes. Plus, we'll, when we do the blood test, we'll, in the serology, serology test, we will also find high amount of anti-tissue anti transglutaminase enzyme, high amount of anti-endomycin, high amount of anti-gliadin, which supports your diagnostic thing. So this is the pathophysiology. Now what are the clinical features here? The, how the patient will present. So as you discuss, the classic symptoms are basically, it is the classic presentation is malabsorption. Malabsorption. So due to the disorder of villa, I can say disorder because the villa is flattened, now absorption is not taking place properly. So what absorption is hampered? Fat, basically fat absorption, there is restricted fat absorption. So restricted fat absorption. So as a result, steatorrhea. Because of restricted fat absorption, there will be steatorrhea. So fat will be passed in the stool. Bulky, greasy stool and stinky. So steatorrhea. What else? There will be, most of the vitamins cannot be absorbed. So due to a non-absorption of, you can say, B12 and other nutrition, iron, there will be resulting in anemia. Though anemia is not following classic signs and symptoms, but anemia is obviously, it will be always present because of malabsorption. And the signs and symptoms of anemia, it can go for, it can also, sometimes patient can also present like that. So along with this, therefore, there is weight loss, associated with malabsorption, there will be nausea, vomiting kind of thing, there will be pain abdomen, and there will be diarrhea also. Now often this question is asked that why there is diarrhea in celiac disease? disease. So diarrhea in celiac disease is multifactorial. Okay, so number one is that there, why there is diarrhea because first of all, this villa is atrophied now, this villa is atrophied, it is flattened. So we know there's the, there in these brush borders, there's brush border enzymes called lactase.
So because of decreased amount of lacto lactase, now all there, the patient will also have lactose intolerance. Okay, because this villa is damaged. So when the villas are damaged, the lactase enzyme it goes down. And now this one who has celiac disease, they obviously they cannot also digest lactose. And we know lactose is an osmotic particle. When lactose is present in the intestine, it will absorb lots of water and produce diarrhea. So diarrhea can be produced because of lactose intolerance. Number two, it is can be also diarrhea can be also because there is decreased fat absorption, which also bring lot of water into the intestine. Also, this diarrhea is associated because celiac disease is very commonly associated with type 1 diabetes. So, diabetic diarrhea can also be there. Diabetic diarrhea. So, diabetic diarrhea, so all these multifactorial causes. Because celiac disease is seen that it is very closely associated with type 1 diabetes. So they can have diabetic diarrhea. Now you can ask me that why there is, what is diabetic diarrhea? So diabetic diarrhea is a condition when diabetic people have diarrhea you can say. Now it is not a rare thing to find diarrhea in diabetic people. So what, is the, what are the things that can produce diabetic diarrhea? So most of the time if there is diabetes people and people are taking metformin, that is a side effect. Diarrhea is a side effect of metformin. Then in diabetes, there is diabetic neuropathy. So because of neuropathy, when neuropathy when the nerves are affected, the myenteric plexus is affected. So myenteric plexus are affected. So it goes down. So it not goes down where we can say the myenteric plexus don't work properly. Okay, it is so as a result there is increased MMC, migrating motor complex, migrating motor complex. So when there is increased MMC, migrating motor complex, so there is less time for absorption of water in the colon. So we know in the large intestine, colon is basically meant for absorption of water. Water is absorbed mainly in the large intestine. So if this contraction in the large intestine is very fast, it's happening at a faster rate, then this stool is getting less time for to stay there. So when there's less time to stay in the large intestine or in the colon, water will not be absorbed properly. So as a result, it can cause diarrhea. So that is a, that are the conditions which can which lead to diabetic diarrhea. So there is, it's a, yes, it is all those things is because of neuropathy. You can say neuropathy. Plus, diabetic people who are taking metformin, this is a very important side effect that they can have diarrhea. And rest of the things is that, yes, so we are in now clinical features. So what is, why there is diarrhea? We are discussing why there is diarrhea. Okay, why there is diarrhea in celiac disease. So diarrhea in celiac disease, for number one is because of lactose intolerance. It is because of lactose intolerance, then there is decreased fat absorption and also it can present with diabetic diarrhea. So that's why there is diarrhea. So what we got in celiac disease still now, we got malabsorption, malabsorption leading to anemia and all the signs and symptoms. Then there can be diarrhea, there can be weight loss, there can be failure to thrive. But these are the classical findings there because most of the 50% of the cases are silent cases. And rest of in 50 percent it's a uh, 20 to 30 percent are nowadays they are presenting with atypical symptoms some patients are only presenting with osteopenia some are only presenting with infertility some are only presenting with lactose intolerance and then when there is a diagnostic procedure is done and serological study is done then they are diagnosed to have what you call celiac disease so basically these are the things what are the associations so what are the associations? The celiac disease is very commonly associated as we associations. So these are the very important, important things that comes in the exam purpose also. So associations. So celiac disease is very commonly associated with diabetes. We, we know that. We discussed. Next thing is that there is 
another is skin disease that is associated with celiac disease that is called dermatic herpetiforms so in dermatic her herpetiforms there are water filled blisters are seen around the skin which is very itchy so water formed blisters so diabetic oh sorry the dermatic herpetiforms there is water formed water filled blister blisters are seen and it is itchy itchy in character because originally when this, this disease was found it was thought it is because of herpes virus infection but now it is confirmed that it is not because of herpes it is because of the cross infections of this celiac disease so it is a, you can say it is a cutaneous manifestation of celiac disease so it is not related to her herpes virus that's why the treatment is not any antibacterial or antiviral or this treatment is in her diabetic herpetiform treatment is and it seems in that Depson is a very good treatment and it gives good result in dermatic herpetiforms so why this dermatic herpetiforms occurs because of cross reactions so that antigen antibody complex so what we can see here so this is the epidermis and there is the dermis so those antigen antibody complex, antigen antibody complex, especially the IgA antibody, which is mainly in the found in the intestinal mucosa. This is a because mucosa related antibody. So this antigen antibody complex, okay. So antigen antibody is like gliadin, antibody, gliadin, and gliadin and antibody, and then what we call endo sorry the transglutaminase TTG antibody. So this complex, they migrate here, plus it will beneath the skin, plus there is lots of neutrophils. Lots of neutrophils are seen. 